Welcome to this instructional video to replace Monday's lecture. So, let's dig deeper as we move forward into enzyme mechanisms. Let's step back and consider hexokinase a little bit more. A hexokinase catalyzes the ATP-dependent phosphorylation of glucose, and it requires a divalent cation, such as magnesium. And you know, we've talked about kinases briefly. Again, they are involved in phosphorylation reactions. So, hexokinase in particular, though, it can phosphorylate in an ATP-dependent manner, glucose or fructose. We've said previously that glucose is actually uh, the preferred substrate over fructose. If given a choice, hexokinase tends to phosphorylate glucose much more effectively than fructose. So this is an example of selectivity. So it is selective toward glucose. So let's see if I can get this written correctly. Selective toward glucose. Of course, ADP is a substrate, uh, excuse me, ATP is a substrate, and then either glucose or fructose can be the second substrate and become phosphorylated. But what we know with hexokinase is, uh, even though glucose is the selective substrate, it is selective toward glucose, it is very specific in terms of phosphorylation. you only get the 6' OH group. Let's say it this way. You only get phosphorylation at the 6' OH. So if we jump up here to glucose, this is number six carbon. Sometimes it's called six prime, that's fine. And then right here, it is this hydroxyl group that is reactive with ATP. And we can see here is that we get glucose six phosphate. So we only get phosphorylation really at the six prime position. So the six prime OH is reactive. He's the only hydroxyl group reactive toward ATP. Now that's important because in glycolysis, which this is the very first step of glycolysis, you need glucose 6-phosphate. You don't need glucose 3-phosphate. You don't need glucose 3-phosphate. You need glucose 6-phosphate. So how is it, how is it that this enzyme will only, with glucose, only phosphorylate the 6' prime position? So the issue is, and again, this is a specificity issue. It is specific toward phosphorylation at the six prime position. So the question is, why? So let's dig a little deeper into this. Again, this uh, page 45 just reminds us what a kinase is. And again, we can have hexokinase, which is a sugar kinase. Or if you've had any type of course in signal transduction, you've heard about protein kinases. Those can be broken up into serine threonine type protein kinases or tyrosine protein kinases. And so again, these are uh, heavily involved in regulation of metabolism and signal transduction. All the kinases require divalent cation. So hey, let's look at this one. Uh, hexokinase, here's magnesium. And you may say, uh, well, what's going on here? Well, this is magnesium ATP. That's a substrate. So it's glucose. For this reaction to occur, to get phosphorylation at the six prime position, then you need the six prime hydroxyl group right here, acting as a nucleophile. Attacking the electrophilic phosphorus atom of the gamma phosphoryl group. So this is the gamma, let's just call it the gamma phosphorus right here. That is, that is electrophilic. 
it has to be electrophilic because the hydroxyl group here is going to be nucleophilic. Now, it's likely that this whole OH group may be become more nucleophilic if there's some type of active site base around. But I don't want to get into that right now. Okay? So what is the what is the role of the magnesium ion? Well, the magnesium ion, and we've talked about this before in terms of metal ions and uh, binding enzymes, is that specifically it's called an electron sink. Electron sinks pull the electrons toward themselves. Divalent cations pull electrons toward them. They are very much electron seeking. If you look at the situation here, in this case that will make gamma P more electrophilic. Much more electrophilic because of the electron sink nature. Also, I have to think that that magnesium ion, although we don't see the transition state here, I have to imagine that that magnesium ion is also involved in transition state stabilization via charge neutralization. So that's the role of the magnesium ion. Kinases require divalent cations such as magnesium. But back to the whole point of why do we only get phosphor, uh, phosphorylation to six prime position? Because it is only, only the six prime OH group that can attack ATP, much like this mechanism shows. Let me repeat that, that's important. The only, the six prime OH group right here, it is, that is the only one that is in position to attack the gamma phosphoryl group or the gamma pho phosphorus atom of the gamma phosphoryl group of ATP. This is why we get this very, very specific phosphorylation. So let's take a, a little detour here and let's look actually at the structure of hexokinase bound to glucose. So glucose is already bound. ATP is not yet bound. So this structure that I'm showing you now is hexokinase with a, a with, excuse me, hexokinase with glucose. And if we look, oh, look, look, look right in there. Look right in there. What is that? If, if we were to zoom in on this, so let's just pretend that we are an ATP molecule. Yes, you are now an ATP molecule. You are headed towards your binding site on hexokinase. Glucose is already in position in the active site, and you are heading into this binding site with your gamma phosphoryl group leading the charge here, okay? Look at what we see here. What we see is that this red oxygen atom here, it's the only oxygen atom that's gonna be in position to react with you, ATP. Guess which hydroxyl group this is? Guess which oxygen this is? This is the oxygen of the six prime OH group. It is the only one available in position to react with the gamma phosphorus atom or of the gamma phosphoryl group. We can spin this around. Look at this. We can go up this way. Again, this is the ATP binding part here. The 6' OH group is the only hydroxyl group in position to attack. So what I've done is I've already kind of filled this out a little bit. So here is, uh, this is hexokinase right here. Use a different color. Right there, that's hexokinase. And we see glucose already bound, and the six prime OH group is what we see there, the OH group. And then ATP is gonna bind right in here. And then they get close enough together. Again, this is a great example of proximity and orientation. What's gonna happen? This six prime OH group is going to attack the gamma phosphoryl group, or the gamma P, gamma phosphorus atom of the uh, phosphoryl group and these electrons will flow up here. I don't want to show you the entire mechanism, but I think you get the point that the gamma phosphoryl group and the 6' OH group are very close to one another in the active site. Again, 
a great example of proximity and orientation in enzymatic catalysis. Well, let's go a little bit further because we've already talked about uh, induced fit mechanism in this class two different times previously. I want to bring it up in terms of enzymes using induced fit. And the best example of that is, yes, you guessed it, hexokinase also uses an induced fit mechanism. Previously, we have discussed, or you read about, induced fit, okay? The first time you read about it was with antibody-antigen interactions. Ladies and gentlemen, didn't that induced fit mechanism allow antigens to bind antibodies more tightly? Yes. You also saw induced fit in terms of Tamiflu binding uh, the neuraminidase enzyme on the outside of influenza virus. Isn't it true, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, isn't it true that the in fact that Tamiflu can bind neuraminidase in an induced fit fashion makes it a more potent inhibitor? Yes, that is true. From an enthalpic perspective, we said that was true. Well, in this case, Induced fit mechanism allows, in the case of enzymes, in this particular enzyme, it allows for ordered binding. So here is hexokinase, right here on the left. And then you see it has a, a particular shape, a particular conformation. What we know is, again, this is hexokinase, with kind of a surface over the atoms, glucose is going to come in here and bind in its binding pocket. Now probably, if we get right down to it, what else is there before glucose binds? This could be an important issue later on. There's probably some water molecules in there because it's probably a fairly polar site. And glucose will come in. And so what we see is that glucose binds first. There is a glucose binding pocket. We have to flush out some water probably, but that's okay. This water is now out here somewhere. Okay. Glucose binds first, and then ATP can bind second. We need this ordered binding mechanism. If you, if you look down here, in the active site, we see, and let's just assume that this is ATP and not ADP. So here's ATP right next to glucose. Well, for this enzyme to do its job, glucose must bind first. How does it achieve that? So the question is, why can't ATP bind first? And I'm just going to tell you right now, ATP binding first would be a disaster. Okay, it would not, this whole mechanism would not work. We need glucose to bind first. How do we control that? Well, we control it because initially, there is not an ATP binding site right up here. Okay, there's a glucose binding pocket, but there is not an ATP binding pocket. The ATP binding pocket is only formed once glucose is bound. And look at this enzyme, ladies and gentlemen, it has clamped around glucose. We can see a different shape of the enzyme here. If we kind of do, if we try to do this, here's kind of the shape of hexokinase. Look at it there. It kind of clamps around glucose. And once it does that, an ATP binding site is formed. Therefore, we get ordered binding. They are both in the active site now, and then glucose undergoes ATP-dependent phosphorylation. So basically, if we go down here, the ATP site only forms after glucose 
binding. So once again, induced fit is a huge issue in terms of, of, of biological systems. We saw it with antigen antibody issues, Tamiflu binding neuraminidase. Here's an example of induced fit and how enzymes can achieve ordered binding. Some enzymes don't do this, but hexokinase, it's very important that glucose binds first, ATP binds second. How do we control this? There's not a cellular traffic cop directing traffic. This is all done by molecular recognition, and we see here that this works well. There's a glucose binding pocket, glucose binds, and then that reveals or constructs, if you will, uh, an ATP binding site. Now they're together in the active site and we can get catalysis. All right. I don't want to even go into what might happen if ATP binds first. Uh, let's just forget about that for this video. Let's do one more thing here before we kind of end this up. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to get hardcore into arrow pushing and enzyme mechanisms. But before we do that, let's take a look at page 49. So what we know is that amino acid side chains or backbone atoms can play in enzymes a catalytic role or a structural role. Now recall, if something is going to be a catalytic residue, it has to be able to do one of these things. It has to act as an acid, a base, a nucleophile. And by the way, only side chains can do these three things, okay? An acid base or a nucleophile, this is gonna be restricted to side chains, okay? Or a catalytic residue can stabilize a transition state, transition state stabilization, okay? Those are the four things possible to be counted as a catalytic residue, okay? So, uh, we kind of, these amino acids have to know their role, okay? So let's, let's look at this table for a minute. Here's, let's start here, the percentage of all residues in enzymes. So basically, if you, if you look, histidine accounts for 3% of all amino acid residues and enzymes, okay? But what this table is telling you, it is 18% of all catalytic residues. Wow, it's only 3% of the total, but 18% of this small subset that's involved in catalysis, acid, base, nucleophile, or stabilizing a transition state. Now, why is that? Why is that? I do want to focus on histidine because this is an important one. Well, we've talked about in this class before, histidine's pKa is, it's close to, I don't want to say approximately to, close to physiological pH of 7. So, in water, the side chain of histidine has a pKa of 6. Well, that's pretty close to 7. We also know, and we've seen this several times in this class, that the environment of the side chain can dictate pKa. And since histidine's pKa is so close to 7, just some slight modifications of it can allow histidine to act as an acid, to be a catalytic residue, or a base. So, for example, if you had histidine A and its pKa is less than 7, which we would predict just in water, right? Well, then its role could be a base. Or histidine B, it wouldn't take much to perturb its pKa to above 7. You know, there's, there, and you should know this already, these environmental influences can modulate or influence pKa. In this case, histidine can act as an acid. So, it takes very small modulation to get histidine in the role of an acid or a base. That's probably the best explanation of why 
Histidine is only 3% of all amino acids and enzymes, but 18% of these oh-so-very-important catalytic residues. I think that's probably the best explanation. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these. Let's, let's take a quick look at uh, lysine. Wow. You know, lysine has a pKa of approximately 10, the side chain. So, you know, what role can lysine side chain play in enzymatic catalysis? I think an acid? Okay, I'd buy that, because at pH 7, it's going to be largely in the acid form. The base? I would be skeptical of that. It would have to have a lot of modulation to bring the pKa of, of lysine, lysine down close to 7. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. In fact, there are some known examples of lysine acting as a base. It's just kind of rare compared to it being an acid or, for example, transition state stabilization via charge neutralization. So I think that's, you know, most transition states that we're going to encounter are oxyanions. Wow, it needs a positive charge or partial positive charge to stabilize it. Can the side chain of lysine do that? So when it comes to lysine, I'm probably going to be thinking it could be an, an acid in an in a mecha enzyme mechanism. I'm thinking it could be a base, but I would be skeptical at first I'd have to know some information about pKa modulation, but I would be very, very uh, accepting of someone telling me that it's stabilizing a oxyanion transition state via charge neutralization. Now, let's look at glycine. Again, I'm not going to go over all these for you. But the side chain of glycine can't do anything. So, you know, we love the side chain of glycine. It's just a, uh, a hydrogen atom. But that's never going to be an acid. It's never going to be a base, and it's not going to be a nucleophile. And so it's probably going to end up with, with glycine, not a side chain issue, but a backbone issue. Probably backbone hydrogen bonding is going to be able to stabilize a transition state. That's probably the best bet, right? Because look at glycine. They're 8% of all residues and enzymes, but only 4% of catalytic residues. Well, the fact that it's even anything beyond or besides zero tells you that it's probably the backbone. The backbone, the backbone, not the side chains, but backbone atoms. Of course, you know, we've got carbonyl and the NH of glycine. They can form hydrogen bonds, and can you, ladies and gentlemen, can you stabilize transition states via hydrogen bonding? Yes, you can. And we're going to see that in the mechanism of chymotrypsin on, uh, on Wednesday. I think we'll stop here. We will start uh, talking about lysosome on uh, Wednesday. And I think this is it for this instructional video. I hope you found this information useful.